Hello, it's Tuesday the 9th of June and this is uh, an inaugural podcast for the NCJ, which is the International Community Development Network, uh, based from De Montfort University in Leicester. And I'm joined today by Professor Dave Ward, Professor Rob Canton, and Mr. John Scott. Have I got everybody's names correct and profiles? Yeah. Great. It's, um, so the purpose of uh, today's uh, conversation and discussion is to think through, talk about, uh, describe and explain uh, the purpose of this network and what uh, people are hoping to get out of it, uh, what some of the key issues are around community justice and how as a, uh, a platform for uh, social development and change, uh, attitudes and thinking about community justice might change uh, as, you know, maybe at the moment as we emerge out of a, a rapid period of destabilisation due to COVID-19 and the lockdown. Um, so we're going to talk to uh, each person in turn. Uh, so should we start off with you, David? David, are you OK to start off? Rob first. Oh, is it Rob first? Sorry, I've got them in a different order. So, Rob, um, over to you. And if you want to tell us for a couple of minutes what your uh, thoughts are about how community uh, justice can be um, better supported. Thank you very much, Rob. And uh, hello to everybody. Um, I thought it would be quite nice to begin by showing people uh, um, to Montfort University, where we had hoped to welcome you. Um, and as this we hope that this project is just this is just the beginning of, a, of, a, of an initiative and <clears throat> this is just the opening of it we thought it would be quite nice to give you a quick tour of the campus um, so this is trinity house uh, which in other times we would have been able to welcome you and show you it's one of the older parts of the university and this is where we might have uh, have held our conference this is Hawthorne Building, where Dave Ward and I uh, reside in, in normal times, if we can remember those. And this is also the home of the Faculty of Health and Life Sciences, which is the basis for the, the project. A bit of history for you. In 1353, the Church of the Annunciation uh, was constructed uh, on the site, part of which is now occupied by Hawthorne. And these two arches are the only remaining parts of, of that church. The rest of it is lost. And it was here in uh, 1485 that the body of Richard III was rested after the Battle of Bosworth before being unceremoniously discarded to be discovered many centuries later in a car park near Tesco. Um, and this is what our modern, splendid, uh, super-duper campus looks like nowadays. So that's De Montfort, and one day we hope to welcome many participants in the network to this venue, but there we go. So I thought it might be useful to reflect upon international exchange. We regard international exchange as self-evidently a good thing, but it's maybe rehearsing, worth rehearsing why we think it's valuable. And the first thing to say is that no single nation has all the good ideas. We can learn from each other's best practices, our good ideas, the opportunities that we've found, and we could also learn from our mistakes. And a personal view is that we don't learn enough, don't turn out as expected, and that's a, a very fruitful source of learning. And some of you may reflect, uh, want to reflect upon the um, thoughts of my friend and our friend Gerhard Pluch, who once said to me, isn't it instructive and fascinating that the rest of Europe looks to see what England and Wales is doing, takes careful notes of all the mistakes it's made, and then makes exactly those same mistakes. Now, the other reason for international exchange is that many crime problems cannot sensibly be managed at the level of the nation state. If you think about things like human trafficking, drugs and terrorism and cybercrime, these cross borders and it's essential that uh, countries work together collectively in trying to respond to them. But we should also think about other white collar 
crimes that take place at a higher level, aggressive tax avoidance where people do all they can to avoid paying their fair share into the common wealth, the uh, pollution and the disdain for the planet that's shown by many large companies, the crimes that commit states, the trading in armaments. From an academic point of view, I also think it's instructive to find that by looking at other countries and making comparisons and contrasts, you get a genuinely new and fresh insight into our own practices and cultures. Sometimes this topic is discussed under the heading of policy transfer, and I myself have used, have written on, on in just those terms, but I've come to be a little bit cautious about this expression. For example, it risks implying that there is one country that knows best and out of the goodness of its heart is bestowing its wisdom on another. And that does run the risk of becoming a kind of colonial, if not an imperialistic exercise. Because the best networking and partnerships are reciprocal, a recognition that we can learn from one another. And another misgiving I have about the expression is that this can't just stop at the level of policy. Ultimately, it's what agencies do not what they say they're going to do that really counts. And notoriously turning policy into practice um, is a, a complex endeavor on its own. And I have worked in countries where the policy statements are sound and tremendously good and the practice falls far short of that. My final reflection is just to note that England and Wales have often been really influential in this work, but in recent years, I think have fallen back there are at least two reasons for that. One is that England and Wales has been introspective, preoccupied with its own governance arrangements, concentrating on how to set up and manage new structures, some of whom, some of which don't make any kind of sense. The other way in which I think our position is compromised or could be compromised, and this is one of the themes we want to explore in our seminars, is the extent to which the departure from the European Union has made that difference. So that's just what I'd like to say by way of introduction and thank you for the opportunity and back to you, Rob. Rob, you you need to unmute your microphone. Yeah, that's a classic, isn't it? Now the host doesn't unmute himself, but uh, yeah, the, the, the idea of reciprocal exchange is, uh, is, is core, I think, to a lot of uh, any kind of community development practice uh, so it's fascinating for me to learn how uh, this is maybe applied in different circumstances. Uh, Dave it's uh, an opportunity for you now to um, tell us uh, your thoughts about criminal justice and its development. Right thanks very much. Um, Rob's, Rob's presentation um, is, uh, is very um, appropriate in some ways, particularly his last point as an introduction to uh, what I'm, I'm going to say. Um, my short uh, input is, uh, it was prompted by reading Bill Mather's paper. And I'll bring up a section of Bill's paper which um, I found um, particularly interesting. Um, when I was reading through his paper and came to this particular slide, um, I read through it and thought, hey, this just doesn't describe the world across the seas in Africa or maybe South America. Um, or certain parts of Asia, I recognize, I recognize some of this in the world in which I'm living today in the UK. Um, and was quite disturbed by it. Um, do these characteristics which Bill, re Bill identified as being characteristics of authoritarian regimes, are they ones which we can recognize in our own society? A bureaucratic centralized command and control hierarchy. A lot is being said at the moment about the fact that our response to COVID-19 has been based on a, 
very heavily centralized process, um, ignoring the local knowledge and the structures that are available at local level and which have been stripped of a lot of their capacity through authority. And that is particularly being debated in relation to the track and trace proposals. Public servants are regularly appointed because of loyalties and tribes not on merit. Well, I would change the words public servants and ask you to think about um, special advisors who now seem to have um, who seem to now have an, an, an inappropriate and, uh, um, and unspecified but very great influence in, um, in, in our governments um, at the expense of, of public servants, as we see in the spat between um, Priti Patel and um, her, um, her, her, her under her um, top civil servant. There's little bottom-up innovation, employee engagement or horizontal communications. Well, I think that is just a development of the first point about um, living in a very centralized, um, a centralized structure in which, um, in which people are increasingly complaining that their voices are not being heard. Um, control is applied through punishments. Well, go back to the, um, the relationships that seem to exist between um, civil servants and their ministers, and indeed between um, civil servants or um, other advisors within the cabinet office. Um, and the way that people go out through the door very, very quickly if they don't seem to be towing the party line. Um, and then the question of parent, patronage and clientism. Well, it's very interesting to me that the track and trace process has been largely, or all, much of the, many of the processes in relation to the response to COVID-19 have gone into the private sector. And I was interested to discover that Serco, which is now leading in this area, is um, the managing, um, the chair of the board is, uh, is Winston Churchill's grandson, Christopher Soames. So, are we very, very, are, are how far are we away from a, a world um, in which the government is, in, is, 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 has embedded within it patron, patronage and clientism? So, um, that prompted questions for me about um, how far can we set us, how can I remove now the, or oh, stop share? That prompted questions for me as to um, what really have we got to um, have what have we got to offer in the um, acting as consultants or trainers um, to um, what are implied to be less sophisticated and less developed systems in other parts of uh, other parts of the world. Um, but linking that with um, with, with, with Bill Mather's points about an authoritarian response. My final question, my question, which I'd like people to go away with and think about, is what has the government's response to COVID-19 done to the UK's standing as a potential partner or even an independent provider in consultancy and training in the criminal justice world, world globally. And I think that links very closely to Rob's final point in his presentation. Thanks very much, David. Um, I'm reading uh, Simone Weil, uh, The Need for Roots at the moment, and I've reached the point where she talks about rootedness and unrootedness and how modern society uh, it become, can become a technocratic um, uh, process. 
So it's, it, these things have been happening for a long time. And um, we, we really do need to address some of these concerns, I think. And it's become more urgent now, particularly with the American experience with uh, the Black, Black Lives Matter protests and the challenge to the American policing model. So uh, lots to think about with that. Uh, John Scott, it's now your turn to uh, uh, give us your thoughts and to talk about what you uh, uh, see as the potential uh, challenges for uh, developing a community uh, justice t t approach. I'm going to talk about my hopes for uh, an, inter an international uh, development network on criminal justice. I was once asked to do a, a speech at a graduation ceremony for social workers who had just finished their degrees. Um, and as a qualified social worker myself, I was thinking, well, what did I get out of my training? And so I was trying to think of something that had real impact on me, whether it was a book or a lecture or an experience. And I decided to tell them about a, a very small incident that had, had a really big and lasting impact on me. And I'd done a placement in um, a, a residential unit that provided respite care for mothers and fathers who'd got severely disabled children so they could have a break. And I was made the key worker for this little chap, we'll, we'll call him Jamie. And he had a, a mental age, say, of about two, although he was five and a half. And he was a lovely, lovely little lad, and it was my job to look after him for much of the day. And it was the first time I'd had this close-up experience, really. And the other, the other workers were, were really keen to help him and move him on. And one lunchtime, uh, they uh, were keen to get the meal over. And I let Jamie feed himself. And I remember we were having a, a sort of risotto dish. And he got his spoon. And this little chap was feeding himself. And when the others had, had gone on and cleared up, Jamie had got his spoon and he was eating. And he, and he chased the last grain of rice around this bowl. And I was there with him, maybe having a little chat. And I was incredibly moved by the fact that this little lad was using his skill to get that last grain of rice. And I have to say to you, that learning had always come very easily to me. And maybe I hadn't worked that hard. I'd been fairly relaxed about stuff. But this little scrap of humanity was doing his very best to get the last grain of rice. And the learning that I'd taken from that was that you had to stretch yourself, you had to be challenged, you didn't give up, you stayed with people and maybe gave them space so that they could do their own stretching and find out what they could achieve in their lives. And I said to these newly qualified probation officers, social workers and probation officers, whatever they were going to go off to do, is that keep on learning, but learn as much from the people that you're with rather than just for yourself. Now, um, we're starting off on uh, this idea of a, a new network, and I have to say, um, I don't know where we're going to go with this network, because I'm very new to social media, um, we're at a strange time in our, our history as, as, as a world that's had to socially isolate, and we couldn't run this seminar uh, at Leicester, we've had to do it online. So we're, in many ways, taking risks, doing new things. And we're going to be learning, maybe every day, about how to take the risk of learning from each other in new ways. And what my hopes for this as a learning environment are, is that we will genuinely get alongside each other in new ways and give each other space, really listen to each other, and perhaps make connections that we would not have made otherwise. So, I want us to be able to say that through the network we can explore new ideas, 
um, make uh, new relationships, maybe different sorts of relationships across international boundaries, because that's the wonder of uh, the new technology that we can meet perhaps much quicker than we would do if we had to get on planes or go to conferences. And that through different ways of meetings, uh, that we can do new sorts of international development work. I'm a bit of a straight lines sort of bloke. I'm fairly direct. I like making things happen and doing things. But this sort of learning, I think, is maybe the sort of learning that happens in circles rather than in straight lines. I also think that um, this is going to be more organic and dynamic, and the sort of learning that maybe young people are better at than as old crusties. So I don't know where this is going to go. I don't know where we're going to end up on our journey or how uh, this is going to grow. But the title of the talk that I gave to that group of students was The Last Grain of Rice. Maybe the title of this talk should be The First Grain of Rice. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, do you want to spend a couple of minutes just having a, a discussion, see how that goes? Is there, is there a common theme that you want to unpick just for a moment, just to maybe bring some of those thoughts and reflections together? Um, I, I wrote down the, the, the kind of, uh, the, there's a thing at the moment, isn't there? You see a lot of people saying, be the change you want to be. Um, I, I was listening to a fascinating podcast yesterday from a Jungian uh, analyst, and she said, actually, forget that. You, what you've got to do is you've got to give yourself space and time the change happens in society. And what you've got to do is give yourself the space and time to understand how things have changed and how things have resettled. Uh, and one of the things about being in the lockdown is it's meant that we're all um, uh, being more contemplative about these changes. So is there anything that struck you um, about the, the kind of forces of social change? What do you think might be different or... Uh, uh, we need to kind of look at as a kind of headline um, we, in a couple of, you know, can we sum that up in a couple of minutes? I certainly think that um, nothing will be the same after the COVID-19 episode. Um, but I think it's too simple to say it's like a war experience because, you know, it, it's very different. But it's like saying, 1945 was very different to 1939. Um, I think for a whole society to have a, a shared and very different experience of how life can be, we've all been forced to, to behave in a different way. And I think economics and social experience is going to be different when we come out of this. Yeah, I agree with um, with all of that, um, and I think Anna's paper that we've enjoyed um, captures some of that really well. And I think, like many people, I'm never sure from one day to the next whether how much life is going to change in precisely what ways. Mm. So I think one possibility: some people are saying, "Well, we'll never be able to meet together and rub shoulders together." I'm not at all sure that that's true. I suspect that in a year's time, we will be able to do those things. And that physically, the world will not be so very different, but culturally and emotionally and socially, the whole world has been seized by the shoulders and shaken. And in terms of the project that we have now, we have to accept Anna's point again about how this harmonizes with a green agenda, that people have been flying all over the world in many cases entirely unnecessarily um, for their own jollies and sometimes for their self-importance. Um, and although I would acquit myself of going purely for the fun, I've gained a lot from international travel. I've been to places as a, a visiting expert that I would never otherwise um, have visited. And occasionally the extravagance of all of this has struck me. So it's precisely today that before the world was turned upside down, I would have been speaking in Dublin to the, C, uh, to the Council of Europe conference of the directors of prison and probation. That conference has now been obviously postponed and it's going to be held instead 
in Strasbourg in November. I love Strasbourg, but I have not committed myself to going, even though the dates are in my diary and I'll take a decision later. But at the moment I think how daft, how expensive, how wasteful to spend three days going to Strasbourg to give a keynote speech when I could sit here in my office and I could do exactly the same thing and they could project it to any number of participants. And I don't I, underestimate the social lubrication that goes with meeting face to face. When we switch off from our talks online, we go off and we do our own things. And when we're face to face, we dine together, we uh, have drinks together, we do all sorts of things that really help these initiatives. And certainly <clears throat> one of my best international experiences was working in Russia. And part of the reason this work was exactly at that social level. And I'll shut up in a minute, but the last thing to say was that I think that another thing that this experience of the virus has taught us is about mutuality, reciprocity. And it's not true, of course, when people say we're all in it together. We're not all in it together. Many of us enjoy comfortable accommodation, adequate food. We're not nice places to walk. And we don't feel it in the way that some other people feel it. We have access, we hope, to, to healthcare, and these things are not distributed evenly. But I <clears throat> don't know if you've seen um, a blog that our friend Fergus McNeil did where he spoke about probation supervision yeah. under COVID and the mutual vulnerabilities that are being exposed here. So the probation officer he's found opens up the question, often on the telephone, sometimes shouting from the foot of the garden path, how are you doing? And the common answer is, I'm all right, how are you doing? And again, a recognition that we all of us have loved ones, we all of us have families, the virus will not respect our social standing or our legal roles. And I think that degree of mutuality chimes with Dave's point about how, what will Britain's standing be the far side? And that recognition that no one can take the high ground and say, mm. we know better than you, I think is one upshot of the crisis that we're the pandemic that we're now in david your thoughts um well one thought is a um um is is a response to what rob has just described and i thought what what was the imagination in the people who were organizing this council of europe conference in dublin that they just cancelled it rather than they had the imagination and the innovation to reconfigure it um, and have really tried to simply take the old model and move it forward six months. And I thought, what a contrast to us. Look what we've done. We're trailblazers here. <laughs> so let's celebrate. Let's celebrate that, that we didn't take no for an answer. We weren't um, driven into a corner by, um, by COVID. Um, and we looked for another way of, um, of, of well, horrible, uh, horrible metaphor, skinning the cat in a different way. So sorry for those who've got feline pets. <laughs> um, so that's that. That's that. I mean, the little presentation that I, I gave, I kind of, <laughs> the more I've thought about it, the more strongly I've come to fee feel about it. And it is one of the, um, one of the concerns that I have going forward and um, a feeling that, and, and John kind of put it very well in, 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 and addressed it and that's, as did Rob in their, um, in their presentations, is that we need to embed a different idea of what consultancy and training are about. Um, because I do feel, and this is it, that as, a, um, as someone who um, is carrying a... Um, a t-shirt that says I am British I've been incredibly damaged 
by the um, by the performance of my government in dealing with COVID and leaving us with a trail of now 50,000 dead and more to come. Um, I, I remember when I did my short a period as a visiting prof in French Canada and nowhere could be more um, skeptical of anglophonism um, and um, colonialism than the Quebecois and but even so when you actually scrape the surface people in in French Canada looked for inspiration and looked for security and stability and good practice and good governance to London rather than to Paris. And I just worry that we've lost that as a result of what's happened over the last few months. Well, there's clearly uh, plenty uh, that we can carry on talking about and uh, many more podcasts and vlogs and blog posts uh, <laughs> will follow. Uh, if anybody wants any more information, uh, you can go to the uh, Criminal Justice Network website, which is criminaljusticenetwork.net. Uh, and you will also find us on Twitter and on LinkedIn if you search for International Criminal Justice or INCJ. Uh, but thank you very much to John, Rob and David. And until next time, uh, have a safe and um, reflective time uh, during the last few weeks of the lockdown. <laughs>